it up for the worship team leading us in praise and worship one more time. Thank you for singing about God's blessing over us here today. It's already been a fresh time in worship with you all, but I want us to go deeper now as we visit the Word of God, and we believe that God's Word is always on time, is always true, and it's always right for the season that we're in. And I believe God has a Word for us here today, and on Mother's Day specifically, what I tend to do is identify a mom that's featured within the Bible, and then put her under the microscope a little bit and see how we can learn from this mother, how we can grow from her, we can identify different things that, that had to do with her life and her walk that we can learn from here today. And that's what I want us to do. We've been in a series in Ephesians chapter six, walking through this chapter verse by verse, talking about spiritual warfare. Well, today I just wanna break out for a quick one-off sermon as we identify a mom in the Bible that we can really grow and learn from here today. I'm excited to jump in the word. I'm excited to preach. I haven't preached in the past month. There's been a variety of people that said, hey, do you still like preach here sometimes? I'm like, yeah, man, let's go. But I'm grateful for all the other voices that have been leading, amen? Can we just give it up for Pastor Joseph's sermon last week was so good from Favor City. And he talked about, I'll always have this in my mind, that, that big sword that he pulled out, right? And he said, when you, when you speak the word, you swing the sword. And just this reality that we have an enemy who gets defeated when we speak back the voice and words of God. And so I'm excited to jump into the word of God today, and we're gonna find our way in 1 Samuel. So if you have a Bible, I hope you do. Maybe you have a phone app. If not, we have the screen for you, amen. And so turn with me to 1 Samuel. We'll pick it up in chapter one, verse one. We'll go ahead and start right from the beginning. If you're there, say I'm there. All right, we got, we got Japper and we got a few others. Anybody else? Let me check, try this side. If you're there, say, I'm there. Yeah. Okay, how about this side? If you're there, say, I'm there. Yeah. If you're ready, say, ready. ready. If you're hungry, say, let's eat. eat. Let's go ahead and eat from this word here today. We're gonna read a lot of scripture and I pray that you would just put yourself in the text, all right? If we read somebody, just go ahead and start to visualize them. Get to know them a little bit. Familiarize, go ahead and put yourself in this setting from thousands of years ago. Here's how it goes. There was a certain man of Ramathim, Zophim, of the hill country. Really quick, if you come across a name in the Bible that seems kind of long and hard to pronounce, just say it fast and keep moving, all right? No one will notice, okay? There was a certain man of Ramathim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, Son of Tohu, not to be mixed with tofu. Son of Zuf, shout out to all the Zufs in the house. An Ephrathite, he had two wives. Hold on real quick, so, somebody just say that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea, right? Let me even highlight that for a second. I wanna take a moment, I wanna highlight that just for a minute because sometimes I think we, we need to be careful and we need to, Make sure we get all of our disclaimers out. Then when you read something like that, that the Bible is not endorsing having multiple wives, the Bible's actually just telling the story, right? The Bible's bringing us into the narrative of this man, Elkanah's testimony and his story. And he's declaring this guy had two wives. I believe that this is a bad idea. It's an anti-God idea. This is not something that God ordained. In fact, in the beginning, God ordained the first ever marriage between one man and one woe man. Because I believe when Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa man, who's that? He looked at one of the animals and said, yo, who is that? I wanna marry her. And he did, and God officiated the first ever wedding ceremony in the garden. A beautiful moment where God said this this man is gonna leave his father and mother and he's gonna cling fast and hold fast to this one woman and they're going to be married for all time while God's given them breath on this earth. I have not found another place in scripture where God changes the definition of marriage. With all that said, we find this man, Elkanah, with multiple wives. 
I'm the husband of one wife. You just met her, Nina. Some of you know her. And I'll just go ahead and say this with all humility. She is all I need. From a patience, from an energy, from a just time management. I don't know how he even did to that. I couldn't imagine having two wives. That would, that's a lot. It's hard enough to, to really just have one healthy marriage. Amen? Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. This is a bad idea. Throughout the Bible, you will find different men who had multiple wives. But here's the other thing. As you study those men, you'll find that all of them were miserable. Facts. And so it, in case you get a bad idea here today, bro, it's not a good idea. And please do, I'm spending time on this in the intro. Because if you leave here and you say, hey man, pastor said I could get, have, have two, there was the two wives. You are misrepresenting the text and, and the instruction that I'm sharing in this sermon. If you got all that, say, I got it. All right, so Elkanah had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. She's the one we're gonna focus on here today. An awesome woman of God who's a mother. The name of the other is Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Let's keep going. Moving into verse three. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. Verse four tells us that on that day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions of to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Verse six, and her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Somebody say, that ain't cool. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah went and wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Now I wish that Hannah would have looked back and said, am I not more to you than two wives, right? In my version, I, that's, that's how I'm like waiting for her to do that. Like go ahead and call this dude out. But she doesn't. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. The first ever parent-child dedication prayer we find in this text, amen? As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I've not drunk, drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Samuel, for she said, I've asked for him from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's just, the, the text is strong in itself, right? God, I pray right now as we get ready to unpack some of these verses in the time that you've given us for this 
service, we pray that, God, we would maximize it, and we invite the Holy Spirit right now to speak to us, to teach us, to grow us, to strengthen us, to help us take a next step. Lord God, we ask you to come down right now and open our minds to see Jesus even through this text. Help us to understand your word better. Help us to leave with tools in our tool belt. Help us to get better in this time. Holy Spirit, speak to us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 As I've been reading this story and really spending time getting to know Hannah, this awesome woman of God that's really featured in these two chapters, it's really 1 Samuel 1 and 2 that focus on Hannah, there's so much we can learn from her. I feel like we could do a character study on the person of Hannah and, and learn so much. One thing that I would give you as an encouragement is maybe later today, just go read the rest of 1 Samuel 1 and get to know the prayer Hannah prayed. So powerful, you get the content of what she was actually praying in her heart during this season of life. Hannah was a woman of God and a mother that is admirable for several reasons. And one thing that I really took from her life, it's gonna be the title of this sermon. And, and when I think about Hannah, what, what I think about these two words really come to mind. Here's where they are. Persistent faith. Persistent faith. Come on, say that with me. Just say persistent faith. Persistent faith. The, the question that I want all of us to wrestle with here today is do you got it? Persistent faith. Not lazy faith, not inconsistent faith, but persistent faith. One thing that defines Hannah along this journey that I've found is that she has this level of persistency about her belief in God that's driving her to move on that's helping her take steps of obedience, that's moving her to get with God, we see persistent faith on display. When I talk about persistence, I wanna make sure that we all have the same definition. Let me give you a definition for persistent. Persistent defined is simply this, continuing firmly or obstinately in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. What does it mean to have persistent faith? Here's what it means. It means that even though you are walking in a season of difficulty, even though you have opposition in your life, which is all of us, amen? amen? Right, we've been in a series on spiritual warfare. All of us have an enemy, including our own flesh is against us. Right, and sometimes you find yourself in a situation like Hannah where you're living out your faith, but there's things that are outside of your control that are even against you. Right, things that you can't even help are still not working in your favor. Like when I think about opposition and difficulty in Hannah's life, I'm like, man, it was rough. I mean, it's bad enough, hard enough to get married to Elkanah and have him one day say, hey, I'm getting married to another girl too. And her have to deal with that and figure out how to move forward with that. Like, and she's there now in this context. That's gotta be hard and painful enough, Amen. How do you be persistent in faith through that? And then to add on to that, this new wife starts popping out babies every time Elkanah looks at her. Right, it says that she had sons with an S and daughters with an S and that she would purposely irritate Hannah and try to shade her for not having babies. Like that's gotta be painful. And what's even more wild about that is it says that she would pick the moments to make fun of Hannah and try to put her down about this on their way to church. It says that every year they would make their way on multiple occasions to the temple that was erected in Shiloh. So these different houses of God, these different temples where people would come to meet with God and offer their sacrifice and pray and worship were, were throughout Israel. One was placed in Shiloh, that's where Elkanah was, that's where the priest Eli was, that's where Hannah is. They would go up to Shiloh to offer their sacrifice and on their way there it says that while they were going up, Penina would be the one that was making fun of Hannah for not having babies. Talk about a difficult situation, amen? Like, I don't know if I would even be mad at 
the story if it says, and then Hannah punched Penina and said, be gone, <laughs> right? Stop trying to creep in. <laughs> You're messing up the vibes. This is not how I envisioned it. This is not what I expected when I got married. But no, what do we find from Hannah here? We find a woman who's broken, who's walking through pain, but is still persistent in her faith. The thing I love about Hannah is that she demonstrated a level of persistent faith. Let me give you that definition again of persistence. Right, she's firm. She says, I'm continuing firmly. Regardless of what's going on around me, I'm continuing firmly. Right, in a course of action, in spite of the difficulty. Come on, are you able to get there, church, today? I wanna challenge you with that. I, I recognize that most consultants and polls say that when people leave church, they typically, if you're lucky, remember one thing. I'm like, out of this whole sermon and whole service, they remember one thing. Here's what I hope you remember. Persistent faith. Faith that says, I'm continuing firmly whether it happens or not. I'm continuing firmly whether my spouse does this or not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold the rope then. I'm going to have faith even if he doesn't have faith. I'm going to have faith even if... She doesn't have faith. I'm gonna have faith, even if my kids don't have faith. I'm gonna have faith, even if people say things about me that are hurtful. I'm gonna continue firmly with persistent faith. I see that in the life of Hannah. Such a powerful way. I think it's important that we cultivate persistent faith. Come on, everybody do this, but don't, hurt, don't hit the person next to you. You're cultivating something right now, right? I think it's important that you cultivate persistent faith. Here's why. Because I really believe, from my personal experience, that people in this world are not impressed with anything but per persistent faith. There's a scripture in 1 Peter chapter three. Here's what it says. It says, whenever anybody asks you about the hope you believe in, always be prepared to give a defense. Here's the problem. Nobody ever asks us anymore. When's the last time somebody came up to you and said, hey, yo, I've been watching your life. Give me a reason for the hope you believe in. We need more of those conversations, don't we? Like Peter's like, yo, we're living so counterculturally with such big hope, with such persistent faith that people are coming up to Peter and the disciples and saying, hey, can, tell me why you have such hope in such dark days. And my friend, then be prepared to give an answer about Jesus, Amen. Like, if that's not your moment to say, I'm just a really good person is all. No, that's a good moment to say, yeah, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. He can save you too, right? That's a moment to do that, to run that play. But the problem is most of our lives lack so much persistency. Our, our lives lack so much consistency. Our lives lack so much of actual real faith, persistent faith. Our lives are more so defined by retreating faith. Too often I've found that people go run into a, a struggle like Hannah and they leave. I'm not going back to church. God didn't hear me. It didn't work out for me. It worked out for her. How come it didn't work out for me? Well, I'm not believing anymore. That's not persistent faith. That's inconsistent faith. Who's impressed by that? Nobody. When you look like the world and believe like the world and talk like the world and have the same type of faith like the world, they're never gonna ask you, hey, what's different about you? I think that when you demonstrate persistent faith in the time of tragedy, there's something that says, whoa, that's different. I need that. Because everybody's struggling, amen? Everybody just went through a very stressful season. <laughs> and we need hope. And we have it, we carry it. So as we're cultivating persistent faith, I wanna give you two ingredients on how to get persistent faith. I, I promise you, I was thinking about this earlier, I was like, how do I just do two? Because there's so many different ingredients that go into the instruction, to go, that go into the recipe on how to cultivate persistent faith. But with the time that we have, we're just gonna do two. I thought about doing a series called Persistent Faith and just go through all the different ingredients, but we're gonna do two today, all right? Might be a book or something, man. That's, shout out to Hannah. Let me give you the first one. In order to cultivate persistent faith, you must have persistent prayer. 
If you're going to be defined by persistent faith, you must have a lifestyle of persistent prayer. I found that anybody who has a profound impact on the kingdom in a persistent way first had a persistent prayer life. Believe that there's so much power that follows this point. The question that I want to ask you is, what type of prayer life do you have? Is your prayer life more casual? Maybe it looks like this. I wake up. Lord, thank you so much for waking me up today. Give me a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. And then you're off to your life, and it's busy, and it's moving, and then you return back at night like God only meets you beside the bed. God, thank you for this great day. Bless me now as I go to sleep. Amen, right? Right? That right there, I don't know if that's persistent prayer. I think that that could be casual prayer. I think that that could be um, selfish prayer. That's prayer that's all about you. That's prayer that's tailored to you, you and your needs. Persistent prayer says, you know what, God? I got a lot going on in my life. I need to talk to you about it. And you start leaning in. You start talking to God. You talk to him when you wake up. You talk to him when you're in the bathroom. You talk to him when you're getting dressed. God, what type of outfit should I wear today? God might speak to some of y'all. Let me keep moving forward. God's like, no, definitely no. All right. Persistent prayer invites God into the drive, into the commute. Persistent prayer invites God into the moment where you're changing a diaper. Can I get an amen? Lord, help me right now. Right? Persistent prayer invites God into arguments and struggle. And I really believe God wants to lean in. Right? You have this very attentive audience of three individuals that is waiting for you to speak. Who? Who? The Father, the Son, the Spirit are all like, can we talk? Get some persistency to your prayer life. I've been reading this little book called Prayer is the Answer. It's written by three collective writings of different men of prayer. E.M. Bounds, Andrew Murray, the evangelist John Wesley. I was reading this quote from E.M. Bounds. I actually shared it at our prayer night on Wednesday night. Let me go ahead and show it to you on the screen. E.M. Bounds says it like this. He says, what the church needs today is not more or better machinery Not new organizations, novel methods. The church needs people whom the Holy Spirit can use. People of prayer, people mighty in prayer. The thing I see in Hannah's life is that she was devoted to prayer, church. Mighty in prayer. Even in her pain, she decided to pray. Right, the text tells us in Verse seven, it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, Penina provoked her. Therefore, Hannah would wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said these lines to her. And verse nine, look at verse nine with me. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. And really quick, I'd like to just go ahead and highlight this phrase, Hannah rose. Come on, say it with me. Say, Hannah rose. Hannah rose. Rose. One more time. Say, Hannah Hannah. rose. While I was studying this text, I felt like the Holy Spirit drew me in and said, focus in on that right there. Hannah rose. Why am I focusing in on that for just a moment? Here's why. And it has to do with persistent prayer. Because at some point, Hannah said, I'm no longer going to surround myself with bad energy I'm no longer going to sit in the space of toxicity. I'm no longer going to allow this. Come on, ladies, give me a word. (laughs) This lady, this scandalous, you know, give her some snaps, all right? (laughs) Someone said villain. I love that, right? This girl to shade me in my husband, Right? I'm no longer going to allow her to make fun of me, irritate me, talk bad about me, put me down as if I'm not good enough. I have to get up and remove myself. Amen? Amen? I love how she says, you know what? You guys can go ahead and have your own little thing going on right now, but I got to go do something that's more important. 
I gotta surround myself with better energy. I gotta surround myself with the right people. Sometimes you gotta hit the block button. So come on, sometimes you gotta hit the delete button, the unfollow button. Sometimes you gotta do something to make yourself take that step of persistency. I love here, Hannah says, you know, I can't stay in this same place. There's something better in front of me. What does she do? She doesn't go and get a gun. <laughs> she doesn't go and make a post. She says, I'm gonna go and talk to God. I love how Hannah says, you know what? Here's how I'm gonna fight my battle. I'm gonna fight my battle with persistent prayer. What happens is, she says, you know what? Let me go ahead and excuse myself from the bad energy, from the toxicity, from the negativity. I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna rise up in faith, and I'm gonna go meet with God. What happens is, she didn't know that in this decision of obedience, the Holy Spirit was already working. Right? Sometimes God will have a divine appointment for you if you'll be obedient. She goes and finds Eli the priest. Eli's a big deal. You don't just get one-on-one -on -one time with the priest like this. Eli happened to be sitting beside the doorpost in the temple when this young woman, Hannah, steps in. He's watching her. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. What she says next is so key. Let's look at it on the next slide. She says, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. What I recognized is not just that Hannah had persistent prayer in the midst of difficulty, right? She had content to her prayer that was powerful. In other words, check this out. Here's the prayer she prayed. God, if you do this for me, I'll give it right back to you. Sometimes our prayers are selfish and we say, God, do this for me, period. Period. God, I really need you to bless me. I really need you to help me. But God is waiting for you to say, why? We call that so that. Tag that so that onto your prayer. So you're saying, hey God, I really pray for a great day so that I can make you known. So that I can see a divine appointment. So that I can see a wonderful miracle. Here's what Hannah prayed. I wonder if her prayer life up to this point was like, God, I really wanna have a baby so I can have the perfect Instagram picture. God, I really wanna have a baby so then she can stop making fun of me. I really wanna have a baby so I can live up to my mom's vision. I really wanna have a baby so I can have the perfect life that I always dreamed of and so I'll do whatever it takes, just let me hit that mark. When she said, hey God, I really wanna have a baby so I can give him back to you, everything changed where the motivation of her prayer had less to do with her, had more to do with God, it changed the way she felt personally. Persistent prayer, let me give you this, write this down. I'm gonna give you a reality statement. Persistent prayer leads to supernatural provision. Persistent prayer, it opens doors that you couldn't open on your own. In this case, it opened up a womb, right, that nothing else could have done. Only God could do that. The persistent prayer of Hannah led to miraculous supernatural provision. It doesn't have to just be in the context of a baby, but what have you stopped praying for? What have you given up on? What dream did God put in your heart that you stopped praying for too soon? What do you need to open back up and say, God, I wanna continue, I wanna pull this prayer back out and I wanna start praying again, but this time with the right motivation, your motivation, your glory, not mine, your will be done, not my will be done. God leans into those prayers and says, now let's do this. James tells us, if you ask with a selfish motivation, it's most likely not gonna happen and if it does happen, it will probably end up backfiring on you. But if you ask with the right heart, a God-glorifying heart, it changes everything. 
I like how Jackie Hill Perry says it. Jackie Hill Perry is an author and spoken word artist, and she says, a lot of times we're praying for things that we have no intention on giving back to God in the first place. The prayers that you pray, what if you start to pray these prayers and say, you know what, God, I'm gonna do this for you. What if, God, we did it together? What if, God, you opened a door and we made you known in this place? What if there's grace in the place? And God's been waiting for you to change your motivation. What if God's like, hey, I'll bless your business if I'm in it. I'll bless that dream if you include me because ultimately I have all the resources anyway. When we change our motivation and our thinking, we invite, I'll bless your marriage if you invite me in it, right? The persistent prayers of women of God throughout the course of the Bible are staggering. I mean, even if you go back to a young lady named Sarah in Genesis, who became an older lady, mid-Genesis, God spoke to to, to Sarah in her young age and said, one day, I'm gonna give you and your husband Abraham a baby. And this baby is gonna be the, the, the next link in the chain that will multiply the entire earth. Your, your lineage, Abraham and Sarah, is, you're gonna be more than you can count in the stars or the sand on the beach. Sarah's now 90. Like, did you sure you heard from God right? This persistent prayer thing has been hard. In her 90s. Until God shows up and says, hey, remember that promise? We're ready now. And you're ready now. And Sarah, it says she laughed in her heart. And the angel said, why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. And he said, no, you laughed in your heart. God is close, amen? But she believed. And she ended up having a baby. And, 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 and they had this baby, Isaac. And later on, we find another person in the Bible named Rachel. And Rachel was unable to have a baby. She, she was barren in the womb and she cried out with persistent prayer. Listen to the content of Rachel's prayer. She said, God bless me with a baby or I'll die. Dang. Talk about radical faith. And we find this beautiful baby boy come from Rachel named Joseph. And Joseph would be the one that God would raise up to interpret the dream of Pharaoh and bring freedom to the people of Israel and provision and food in a time of need. How about the persistent prayers of Rachel ended up being the life of Joseph? But don't stop there. What about a lady named Ruth? Ruth comes on the scene, and Ruth is married to a Moabite man. They're not able to have children. This man dies Ruth says, there's nothing left for me here. She follows right, her mother-in-law, Naomi, to Bethlehem, the place of bread. She follows him there, meets her Boaz. Come on, somebody, right? She met Boaz. He wasn't a broke-ass, right? He wasn't a lame-ass. He was a Boaz, amen? Come on, we can laugh at church, can't we? Right? She says, "This, this is persistent prayer leads to supernatural provision. And they end up having a, they got married first. You got to get married first. Some of y'all are praying for a spouse. Some of you in this season of singleness, change your prayer from, God, provide for me the right spouse because that's what I need. And change that to, God, provide for me the right spouse because we want to give you glory. And I think we could even do more glorification if we do it together with the right person. So I love the illustration of you running this race hard after Jesus. If you look to your left and right and you find somebody running hard with you, that might be somebody to consider, amen? Amen. But Elkanah, not if she's already married. (laughs) Be clear here. If the person's running next to you, already next to somebody, let them run, all right? Come on, somebody, amen? amen? We see here persistent prayer in action. Fast forward all the way up to the New Testament. You'll find this older couple in their older years, Elizabeth and Zechariah. Ordinary couple, small town, doing his priestly duty. Zechariah goes into the temple. He finally got picked. They drew lots. They literally drew lots, picked Zechariah. They said, Zechariah, you get to go in the temple this year and offer up the incense of prayer. 
Because prayer is powerful. Prayer is like an incense. It wells up into the nostrils of God as a pleasing aroma. Come on, has anybody ever been to the mall? You walk by Bath and Body Works, and it just, whoa. That smells good. Come on, that watermelon fragrance. That happened to me the other day. Someone brought some canes around me. I said, whoa. Who brought canes and didn't offer me any? No, just playing. That persistent prayer wells up like a pleasing incense. Right, And so Zechariah and Elizabeth, are. In, Zechariah is now offering his quick prayer, and, it, and he says he prayed to the Lord. Now, I, I, I really think we don't know the content of his prayer, but we just know the answer at that moment. The angel came down and appeared to Zechariah and said, I heard your prayer. And he says, and Elizabeth is going to conceive, and she's going to give birth to a baby boy, and you should name him John the Baptist. Right? That persistent prayer. What I'm saying here is this. I, I, there's no guarantee recipe that persistent prayer is going to lead to a miraculous baby. I just know that persistent prayer throughout the Bible leads to supernatural provision. It could be for a business. It could be for a church. It could be for a piece of land. I know that our church was praying for a piece of land seven years ago. And now, seven years later, we're starting to see the miraculous fruit of the persistent prayer. Amen. Right, And we're not stopping there. There's more to pray for. We're praying for favor with the neighbors. We're praying favor with the county. We're praying for miraculous financial provision to see the dreams. It's the dreams that are outside of your capacity that require persistent prayer. And then that checks God into the game where he says, let's do, let's do this together. And maybe you would have this thought right now, wow, God kind of seems like he's kind of for himself. You're absolutely right. God has always been for God because he's that good. But don't you dare think that God is selfish. God did about 200 miracles just to get you here today. He was moving traffic lights. He woke you up. Your heart's beating. Your mind's thinking. God did that, amen? The Bible tells us that God clothed the flowers He's been at work way before you woke up. It says that God fed the birds today. In other words, how much more will he feed you? How much more will he take care of you? Persistent prayer changes things. Let me give you the second point, and this point's gonna be really short. We don't have too much time to go deeper into it, though I'd love to. When it came to Hannah, she had persistent faith, and she cultivated it by persistent prayer. And the second point is, Persistent worship. Persistent worship. The two things we see Hannah doing in this first chapter of 1 Samuel is persistent prayer in the time of struggle and chaos and unhealthy relationships. Prayed through it. Friend, you gotta pray through it. If you have an unhealthy marriage and you're not praying for your spouse, you're missing the first step. If you want a baby and you're not already praying for that baby, you missed the first step. Prayer changes things. Prayer sets things into motion. The second point that we see here is that she not only had a healthy appetite for prayer, friends, she had a healthy appetite of worship. Sometimes you have to worship through your storm, amen? Sometimes you have to worship your way into worship. I don't really feel like singing. I don't really feel like praising. I don't really feel like going up to the temple because every time we go, she always hates on me. She went anyway. I don't really feel like waking up and going to a warehouse. She went anyway. Persistent prayer, persistent worship lead to persistent faith. I love that in verse 19. Well, in verse 18, she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. The woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. It... I, I, I share verse 18 because I want to say this before we close. Hannah was no longer sad when she prayed with the right motivation. When she gave it to God and released it to the Lord and said, Lord, I really want this child. And if you do it, it's up to you. I give him back to you. She left and was no longer sad. And verse 19 says, here's what she chose to do. Verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. 
Before there was ever little Samuel, there was worship. Before God did the miracle, there was worship. I once heard somebody say, you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're about to enter into a storm. Whatever season you're in, enter with worship, amen? What's the Psalm say, Bashan, right? It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with praise and worship. I love Hannah's story because she worshiped through her storm. Continually getting back up and going back to worship. I would challenge you to make it a regular, persistent pattern to get to church, amen? A persistency to get here on Wednesday nights. Cancel stuff. Put it in your calendar and say, I have to have a persistent prayer life, not an inconsistent prayer life. I'm gonna show up Wednesday and Sunday and do a charge group. That looks like persistency. Anything else kind of looks like casualness. Why not be great? Why not give it your all in this short amount of time God has given us, amen? Persistent prayer leads to supernatural provision. I, I'm grateful for my mom that's over here who showed me a card that she wrote to me when I was two years old on Easter Sunday, 1990. I'm so glad you still have that card, mom. And here's what it said. It said, Jesus is risen and I'm praying for you. The persistence of prayer leads to supernatural power. It might have taken 18 more years for that prayer to be answered. But here's how God answers prayer. He either says yes, he says not yet, or he says I even have something better. It's never a no. It's never a nope. It's, you know what, it's gonna happen. Or it's just not, not yet, just wait, wait a little longer. Waiting is not wasting. Waiting is strengthening, right? Waiting is powerful. Or God's saying actually what you asked for isn't even at the level that I wanna give you. I got something better. So just wait on that, right? I think, I, I think of George's testimony. I, I often think about George's story and how persistent prayer, let, you're a product of prayer, George. George, for those of you who don't know his story, was in a freak car accident that had him left in a coma with his legs amputated, negative 5% chance to live, was communicated to his mom. He said, your son has a negative chance to live by 5%. And Olga said, well, let's pray about it. And she, she tapped into persistent prayer. God, you have to do it. Back at you, God. It's me again. I think about my son, Epath, when I think about persistency. Hey, Dad, can we go get an icy... Yeah, in a minute. Hey, Dad, I just said in a minute. Can we get an ice? I'll forget about it. I'll see him. Hey, Dad, ready to get the icy? <laughs> persistency, right? Let's go get the icy already. Come on. God's like, hey, I want to see persistent faith that leads to supernatural provision. Here's how it happens. Prayer and worship. Now, we could go into the word of God. That counts. Church attendance counts. Serving counts, discipleship counts, confession of sin counts. All of that helps boost faith. But friend, persistent prayer and worship is what we see in Hannah's life that led her to be the great mother she became. Hannah had five more children after she had Samuel. When Samuel was born, she nursed him and then she took him to the temple of God and said, he, he's gonna grow up in this temple. And Samuel is the most important figure in the Old Testament between Abraham and David, Samuel. Such a key piece, a product of a praying mom. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we come before you in Jesus' name right now. We recognize how much we need you. And so, God, today we come with persistent prayer. Even right now, I wanna pray with persistency over our sister, Emma Berkey. We're praying for miraculous recovery. We're praying for supernatural strength. God, help her to walk again. 
God, we're praying that you would release healing into her body and supernatural strength. God, even right now, I want to pray with persistency over my sister, Chloe, in the back, my brother, Noah. And God, I just pray that you would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and bring healing to my sister's spirit, strength to her heart. God, I pray for students here tonight that this morning there would be young adults and students that would say, God, I'm gonna take my burden to you in prayer. If it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about, taking it to you. God, I'm praying for everybody here today. And if somebody doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, right now, it's your moment. So right now, just say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, I repent of my sins on this Mother's Day and I ask for your Holy Spirit anointing. Change my heart, change my mind, change my prayers. Help me to walk again, help me to dream again, help me to live again. God, I hit the reset button. I'm starting fresh today. Holy Spirit, fill me with, love, with, with air. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for rising from the grave. And right now I declare faith in Jesus. I turn away from sin and I press on with persistent faith toward him. Jesus, before I close this prayer, I wanna pray for all the moms in the room. I pray that they would continue to pray with persistency the way Hannah prayed. And God, I pray for all the the moms that are still praying for a baby or praying for another baby. God, you are into the supernatural. And God, I pray you would open the wombs of these married wives that are praying for a baby the same way you did for Hannah, the same way you did for Sarah, the same way you did for Ruth. God, we trust your will and plan. And we ask these prayers not for our glory, but for your glory. We pray that these future babies that we're praying for right now would grow up and be the future leaders of Walk Church, the future leaders of this city. God, we pray for the next generation to rise up and be better than our generation, to be the generation that leads people and disciples people to Jesus. God, help us with our prayer, help us with our worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Amen.